It is my honor today to welcome you to this very unique and beautiful location within Arlington National Cemetery and to do so on Veterans Day. What a special event. Today, members of the Collegiate Military Honor Society, known as the Pershing Rifles, have come to our nation's capital along with Pershing Angels and Blackjacks. They have gathered from the four corners of the United States to start an amazing journey. Each year we pause to honor one of this cemetery's most accomplished and notable members, General John J. Pershing. These young cadets are about to travel across the globe as they follow Pershing's Paths of Glory. General Pershing's life story epitomizes much of what Arlington National Cemetery represents. Pershing was appointed the General of the Armies of the United States and while he rose to the highest military rank our country has ever established, Pershing's wish was to be buried here with a simple upright government marker like those you see all around you today, watching over those he led in battle. Thank you all again for being here today and to honor this American hero. From his humble beginnings in Laclede, Missouri, to his role in defeating Germany in the war to end all wars, Pershing led a storied life. His warfare strategies not only changed military thinking in the early 1900s, they shaped the way the military functions today. The Pershing Rifles, Pershing Angels, and Blackjacks are Pershing's living legacy of the Varsity Rifles that he founded in 1894. Before I joined, I didn't know much about Blackjack Persian. I like heard about him because I've been doing a little bit of research on West Point. There's so many great qualities that you can instill in yourself. I'm in the leadership position right now for uh, the Blackjack Association. I have another uh, two years in Camden Military Academy and I'm trying to be the captain of Blackjack drill team. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this most hallowed ground as we honor one of our nation's great military leaders, General John J. Blackjack Pershing. No one person more embodied the determination, will, and fighting spirit of the American people than General John J. Blackjack Pershing. General Pershing was also ahead of his time in regards to integration within our Army. Based on his experiences commanding the all-black 10th Cavalry, which distinguished itself during the Spanish-American War, Pershing became a champion and unrelenting advocate of black soldiers, earning him the nickname Black Jack Pershing. Sir Isaac Newton once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. General John J. Black Jack Pershing is no doubt one of those giants whose shoulders we stand on. His vision and courage helped shape what is today the greatest army in the world. The second stop on their journey is a trip to Pershing Park in Washington, D.C., not far from the White House. It's there that a new memorial is being built of a bronze sculpture depicting the story of one American soldier joining, fighting in, and surviving World War I. At the memorial site, Kevin Collins Nelson, a Pershing rifleman, is joined by John Branch, a blackjack, and Victoria Rose Reed, a Pershing angel. So Pershing Angels were a sorority. We're actually called the National Society of Pershing Angels. So what we are, we're the sister organization to the National Society of Pershing Rifles. The National Society of Pershing Angels, do you feel it's helped you as far as finding where you want to go or finding your place in the world? It's helped me to kind of reevaluate things in my life, put on like what's important, what's not. So I know you're a blackjack. What does it feel like to be a part of something that started so long before? It's like, it's kind of like a true family experience. It's a pretty cool bond. After exploring Pershing Park's plaques and statues, Kevin's admiration for General Pershing takes on new meaning. Whenever I think about Pershing and the influence he's had on my life, I just think about where I'm headed, what I want to do, but also where I started. Like, as a, a Pershing rifleman, one thing that's really big with us is trying something new. This guy, he stands so tall, and there's a reason for that. It's his morality and I don't know, it's just General John Jay. After leaving Washington, D.C., the group travels about a 1,000 miles west to Laclede, Missouri, boyhood home of General Pershing. There, they meet David Poe, a Pershing rifleman 
army captain and a wounded veteran who served in Afghanistan. Today, David is a board member at the Pershing Museum and an expert on all aspects of the general's life. Once the cadets get settled in Pershing's hometown, he and Kevin talk about the man who brought them all together. General Pershing was a man that believed in training leaders for tomorrow. Is there any moments in particular that he experienced that you felt like you kind of went through something, if not similar, exactly the same? I would say that his time in the Philippines stands out. He was a bit of a diplomat and a warrior at the same time. And when you're fighting a counterinsurgency, you have to play both sides. An example is there's this valley in Kunar province called the Dab Valley. And so when I came in country, I had just been promoted to first lieutenant, so I was still a baby in the army, no combat experience. And all of a sudden now I'm in a meeting with the district sub-governor, the police chief, a bunch of village elders from Dob. These are people that 60 days previously, we were duking it out. Um, and yet here we are sitting down um, in there unarmed. You said unarmed? Unarmed. In Pershing, you know, there's a story of him doing the same thing, walking into a meeting of tribal elders of the Moros. He went in unarmed and he walked out just fine, but they respected him for it. And that was kind of the same thing we were trying to do. The fact that we could get there is just an example of how you had to balance diplomacy with being a soldier and accomplishing your mission. The example set by General Pershing by placing diplomacy ahead of military confrontation is something that resonates with both men. Do you feel like Pershing's experience has helped you prior to you being put in this position? I think he absolutely had an impact. How does it feel walking in the footsteps of Pershing and learning about his life? I hope that we can bring a little bit of a consciousness back to our country that you know, they can realize that there are millions of people who achieved an incredible feat. Building an army, deploying it, and then being the deciding factor that ended the war to end all wars is, it's Herculean in stature. And I want people to understand that that happened. Prior to World War I, the United States couldn't really compete with the colonial powers of Europe. So we were never expected to project combat power and influence on a world stage. World War I changed all that. We had shown up and saved the day in Europe. While David and Kevin talk, other members of the expedition team spread out to meet residents of Laclede who had direct connection to General Pershing. John Branch, you're a Pershing rifle? Blackjack. Junior Pershing rifles, right? Yes, sir. What would you like my generation to know about Pershing? There's so many things your generation should know because there's so many things about Pershing that affected the whole history of the United States military. He was just a natural hero. His role in fighting the Indians to go on with Teddy Roosevelt to San Juan Hill or chasing Pancho Villa down in Mexico and the expeditionary forces in World War I and his attention to the Battlefield Monuments Commission when he was kind of the father of getting that all started over in the cemeteries in Europe after World War I. He dedicated his whole life to the military. He ought to be recognized for a life that we should be a model to any of our young people, I think. A little later, David and Kevin joined the others at the Laclede Cemetery. While there, David tells the story of Captain Pershing's exploits in the early 1900s, forging a lasting peace with the Islamic Moro tribes, who called him emir, or honored leader. So think about the amount of respect you're showing somebody when you are, you're at odds, you're in armed conflict with one another, and yet you're willing to walk into that meeting completely unarmed. The show of faith that the Moros weren't gonna kidnap the American commander and hold him ransom. So was there any validity to the supposed story that General Pershing had soaked bullets in pig's blood during the Moral conflict? No. You're talking about an individual who understood and valued diplomacy uh, over violence. The tour of Laclede continues with a visit to the old country schoolhouse that launched General Pershing on his path to glory. All right, guys, welcome to uh, the Prairie Mount School. Education was a big part of General Pershing's life. He saw it as a way to better himself, better his life, and provide much more opportunity. This portion highlights the fact that he was captain of cadets all four years he was at the academy. I know that he taught African-American students. Initially, he took a teaching position here in Laclede, and there was, I guess, bigotry on both sides. A lot of white people didn't want him teaching there, and a lot of black people didn't want him teaching there. They wanted a black teacher. Despite existing prejudices of the time, 
General Pershing was an advocate for African Americans long before it was socially or politically acceptable. His service in the late 1890s with the all-black 10th Cavalry, Buffalo Soldiers, helped shape his views on race. Pershing's unwavering support for black troops helped lead the way to President Harry S. Truman's executive order in 1948, which abolished racial segregation in the United States Armed Forces. This order promoted racial equality and helped set in motion the civil rights movement of the 1960s. We talk about his roots here and his upbringing, you know, kind of shaping his character and, and right. his train of thought. I mean, he grew up, his father was a fairly well-to-do businessman until the Panic of 1873. So they had servants. They're around all the time, right? It was this African-American family. Well, they had kids who would have been young Johnny's playmates growing up. You know, we talk about your experiences kind of shaping your perception of the world. I think for General Pershing, that started at a very young age. Whereas other people in this town, say folks who couldn't afford to hire servants, wouldn't have had that exposure growing up and therefore wouldn't have been maybe as open-minded you know, given the, the political and the cultural climate of the late 19th century. Following the schoolhouse tour, Pershing Angel Victoria visits the farm of 91-year-old Eclede resident Janelle Holloway. So powerful was the general's stature and bearing that she clearly remembers his visits home when she was a youngster. I was a child. I remember his military bearing because we'd grown up hearing about what he contributed to the world. Seeing the biggest name in this town coming back home for a simple ceremony, what was the atmosphere like? Excitement, some of his family there. I believe his birthday was September the 13th. Every year we have uh, the weekend closest to the 13th is designated as Pershing Day in Laclede. What does this place mean to you? Lots of good words. I can't think of anything bad. That's always a good thing. After visiting Laclede, it's time to bid farewell and go global, as the cadets follow General Pershing's path to Paris, France. There, General Pershing established his first headquarters overseas. The first stop was Pershing Hall, an historic building run by the American Legion, containing World War I memorials and tributes. With Pershing Foundation Chairman John Chatelain, MD, acting as host, the cadets prepare for the next phase of the journey by getting to know each other better. What about with you guys in blackjack? Like, what qualities do you feel like you guys have taken away from this? Well, come on, you guys literally showed up to the national convention this year, right? And you placed, what, second? And you competed against colleges. This is a great story because you see how you guys had to come together and learn how to be a, a cohesive unit because when you start chucking those things in the air, <laughs> right, you've got to trust the person who chucked it and the person's going to catch it. we got to come together as a team and do it. you got to pull it off. Some people watch the regulation routine. Some people watch the color guards, but everyone's there for the exhibition yeah. stuff, right? We want to see you throw the rifle in the air. I feel like you have to have a scar. If you drill, everybody has to have yeah, at least a scar. Like it's like a right we, we teach, We've been talking a lot about drill, but how does drill relate to leadership. Everybody has to do their part, and if one person's not doing their part, it can mess up everything you have going on. You have to look out for each other. It can't just be, well, I'm gonna look good, and who cares what this guy looks like? It's like, now nah, we're a team. So now you realize you gotta like set yourself aside and really think about what's good for everybody else. The cadets agree that participation in activities such as rifle drill competitions served a bigger goal, teaching them teamwork and leadership skills. It is a feeling shared by Pershing Foundation Chairman Chatelain. I guess my big question is, so, you know, your position as the chairman of the foundation. So we have this Pershing Foundation, you know, named after General of the Army's John J. Pershing. It exists in part to support the Blackjacks and the Pershing Riflemen. In this day and age, we need to have and know about the real heroes. John Pershing, Blackjack Pershing, is a legitimate hero and he's someone folks need to know about because we need real role models. And that's what his legacy is. General Pershing's legacy is one of honor, acceptance, and integrity. To see proof, one need look no further than his nickname, Blackjack.
The origin of General Pershing's nickname, the name that the National Society of Blackjacks goes by, it was actually meant as a derogatory name. When he went to West Point, he was a bit of a disciplinarian. Well, the cats didn't really respond to that very well. Uh, so they used a very derogatory name to refer to him. Now that was eventually censored in the, in the papers to Blackjack. I think he wore that as a badge of honor. The derogatory name the West Point cadets gave him absolutely came from his time with the Buffalo Soldiers. While in Paris, two cadets gain a deeper insight into Pershing's personal life. I'm falling deeper and deeper in love with you every minute. It is such a wonderful thing to love you and to have you love me. My darling boy, oh, I do love you so, and I want you so much. Let me climb into your arms and hold me all close. Victoria and Kevin are holding the actual love letters that Pershing and his wife Frances had written to each other when they were apart. We spend all our time learning about his military history. We don't ever really get into like the personal, you know, the heart of him. Like, so reading this is actually kind of just a little bit weird. I think it's just an interesting aspect because you never get to see how their partners felt about everything. And for the fact that he can write these letters back to her in times of war, I wish guys nowadays would write letters like this. The level of compassion he had for his soldiers, it's not a surprise now that he could be that compassionate. At any point in time, it could be the last letter. Sadly, one of those letters would be the last. Who would have thought that you'd have to be over there fighting to protect those you love just to find out that you actually lose them? The loving relationship of General Pershing and his wife came to a sudden, tragic end. He actually had just got back from the Philippines, and he was already given his new orders, which were to go to El Paso, Texas, to protect the U.S. interest during the Mexican Revolution. And so his family, being back home in San Francisco, they actually died in a fire. And they all died of smoke inhalation, with the exception of his youngest son, who was saved by the African-American servant that worked in the house. It was an ember that rolled out of the fireplace. The whole house went up. In a blink of an eye, lost his entire family, with the exception of one, the one sliver of hope. And so, you know, how do you come back from that? After the heartbreaking death of his wife and three young daughters in August of 1915, Pershing was never the same. Only his six-year-old boy, Warren, survived. Leaving his son with family members, he returned to Texas, where he was soon ordered to capture Pancho Villa in Mexico. It was his last big campaign in the Americas, before he would turn his attention to the war raging in Europe. Upon leaving Pershing Hall, the cadets head east to Suey, where General Pershing maintained his first frontline headquarters on the Voie Sacre. There they meet with costumed war reenactors, who have gathered for a centennial commemoration of World War I and with members of the press. Pershing's memory and just his life, it means a lot here, I mean, well, there in America. And we try our best to embody that with everything that we do. We focus not only on the military and the drill aspect, but on the moral and the leadership aspect. And our goal as Persian Rifles and as Blackjacks is to pull that out of it. My father, he, he, he gave me his helmet. I brought a after being interviewed by French television, the cadets put on an impromptu demonstration of the famed Pershing rifle drills for reporters and visitors in attendance. Manual, arms, one, two, three, four. That's what my father would call real GI. <laughs> Joining the group is Sandy Pershing, the wife of General John J. Pershing's grandson. As a third generation descendant carrying the Pershing name, she has flown in from the United States to represent the family. So you said it's the first time you come here in Suyi, where uh, General Pershing were uh, in uh, 1918. So uh, how do you feel? I feel very nostalgic. I had no idea of how emotional I would feel about coming here. Throughout the day, the French people show their appreciation for the Americans in attendance, both today and 100 years ago. Everybody knows that during the First World War, France would have lost everything. I think there was something like one million uh, American uh, soldiers at the end of the war, and uh, 
Or is it like uh, an American state in a way? It would be fair to say that France is our oldest ally. We haven't always had maybe an alliance mm -hmm. officially, but certainly the first country uh, that we had an alliance with and therefore our oldest ally. As the ceremony draws to a close, it is time to hit the road again. 11 miles north of Sui, the next stop is the legendary battle site, Verdun. During World War I in 1916, this is the furthest the Germans advanced on Verdun. So this is ultimately where they were stopped. The Battle of Verdun lasted almost a year, making it the longest battle in human history. In terms of lives lost, the conflict was one of the costliest, with French and German armies suffering nearly one million casualties. There's a good reason why historians called World War I the war to end all wars. Military and civilian casualties were more than 41 million people. The cadets explored the historic Verdun site where so many lives were lost. So this would have been a, a machine gun position that was used to protect kind of the dry moat that surrounded the fort. In 1916, all of this would have been gone. This would have just been a complete wasteland. Germany tried to defeat France here. France won. That's the significance here. If the French had lost the Battle of Verdun, I'm not sure how much longer they would have held out. The French were strong and managed to repel Germany and hold on to Verdun as 1916 drew to a close. But Allied victory in the war at that time was still uncertain. 5,000 miles away in Washington, D.C., a decision was made to get America's leading general involved in the overseas war. Leaving Verdun, the cadets continue following General Pershing's path through France. Their next stop is about 32 miles to the southeast, to the hill called Monsec, and a monument that commemorates General Pershing's first great battle of World War I. All right, gentlemen, so we're up here on the Mont Sec American Monument, which is a commemoration of the AEF's contributions to the Battle of Saint Mihiel. With us, we have Florence from the American Battle Monuments Commission. Really what we want to do is kind of talk about the history of this offensive. It was the first major US operation really since the end of the Civil War. American pride, kind of a, a national identity during the war. This was the first real test, and had he failed here, it would have proved all of the Allied commanders and leaders who wanted American blood in French and British units, but they didn't want American commanders, it would have proven them right. So there was a French corps placed under command of General Pershing for this operation, and they were kind of positioned just east of Mont Sec, all the way through the Meuse Heights and up to Saint Mihiel. Uh, General Pershing thought it was very, very important after four years of occupation that the French were the ones who liberated Saint Mihiel. Ultimately, it would be the French uh, that kind of take this hilltop, but it was all under General Pershing's command. From high above the Mont Sec battle plane, the group's French guide points out where French and American soldiers forced a German retreat. The Americans were settled here with uh, 550,000 soldiers. We haven't seen a concentration of forces like that in, in modern days. General Pershing's American forces charged into battle with a revolutionary new strategy called Combined Arms Maneuver. General Pershing successfully deployed artillery, tanks, infantry, and airplanes to drive the enemy from their trenches into the open in a ferocious fight to the death. It's a routing success for Pershing. Most of his divisions actually accomplished their day one objectives by noon. Sami Hill validated the American army in the eyes of the Allies. An American victory here proved Pershing right. About 10 miles to the south of Mont Sec, the cadets arrived at Fort de Joy. The fort was built in 1883 and was instrumental in the defense of France. All right, gentlemen, welcome to Fort Joy. We're at the southern end of the St. Mihiel salient, so it would have been a ridge line just south of the Germans' position. And actually, American forces were stationed right inside here during World War I. Patton himself was here. Pershing, a little bit further north, where he could kind of overwatch the American advance. We're gonna go talk a little bit about some of the causes of World War I. The thing that continues to impress me is the gratitude the French people feel towards Americans. These folks remember World War I. 
World War I, a plot to assassinate the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was the spark that kind of lit World War I. While the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the war's immediate cause, historians continue to debate other factors that led to World War I. It is generally agreed that rising militarism and nationalism escalated tensions in Europe. In addition, many countries had signed treaties stating that if one country was attacked, allied countries were bound to defend them. Each one of the cadets has studied the war to some degree, especially Roberto Duran, who is in training to be an Air Force pilot. World War I, I know for sure, started in 1914. We kind of didn't want anything to do with it for about two years. Eventually, we were forced into it. We had our trading partners in Europe. That was a big thing for our economy back then. When Germany decided to really attack certain ships that were bound for England or France or really any country in Europe, that put us at risk. And we lost a lot of Americans through the sinking of the Lusitania. And there was no way we were going to stay out of it. This is the plateau that the salient was kind of formed on. So this actually would have been an old kind of observation platform. So not only did it have a great view of the battlefield, but if you notice, you've also got a great view of kind of the defenses unique to this fort. After touring Fort DeJoy, the cadets were joined again by Sandy Pershing, who spoke movingly of the country her famous relative helped defend. It's so beautiful and quiet now. It's very hard to believe that there was so much death and destruction in the forest. All the trees were gone. It's just unbelievable that the Americans could get through. General Pershing wanted the war to be over. He didn't want to lose American troops. I'm here because cadets are here, and I thought I should see what they were seeing. Back on the road again, the cadets travel about 50 miles to the northwest, where they come to the monument of Montfaucon, honoring American leadership in the News Argonne Offensive. It was here the American expeditionary forces, led by General Pershing, finally started to turn the tide in favor of the Allies. World War I, two of the most significant American battles, right? We had Sami Hill, and then we have the Meuse Argonne. So the Meuse-Argonne was part of the 100 Days Offensive. It was supposed to be the battle and was the battle that kind of broke the Germans back, right? It ended the war. All night, sun sets, the American army opens up an artillery bombardment. About 4,000 cannons hit this entire line to include Mofocon. We held it, became part of our line, and then we eventually advanced. Pershing symbolically embodied the American army for the French. Remember why we were here, though. The United States wasn't attacked in World War I. We were fighting for liberty in France. The general offensive, and specifically the Meuse-Argonne for the American portion of the war, it brought the Germans to the peace table. The Meuse-Argonne offensive, fought from September to November of 1918, ended the war. But it came at a cost. This battle was the war's bloodiest encounter. Over 50,000 German and American lives were lost. There's a great excerpt where Pershing is in a vehicle with his driver. He's going up and down the front, and he actually kind of cries out to Frankie, his wife, who he had lost a couple years prior, essentially saying, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know how I continue to do this. Um, and he kind of breaks down for a moment. I mean, just the sheer weight of the responsibilities of leading two million men. I think he understood that human life is sacred. Ultimately, I think his time as the commander in chief of the American Expeditionary Forces was the pinnacle of his career. While the cadets continue to explore the battlefields around Montfaucon, Sandy Pershing visits the 1,300-year-old San Miguel Abbey, which miraculously survived the war. Her companion is Helen Patton, the granddaughter of General George S. Patton, who as a lieutenant colonel served as General Pershing's aide in World War I. Patton would come to model much of his military style after the man he considered his mentor. We seem to go to war, and yet the end is always the same, and so many families that are ruined. I can only imagine how 
melancholy the general would have been because this was just the beginning. And he realized how serious it was going to be. He'd never been involved in anything so large. He, as more than anyone else, would have known what it would have been like to have received news like that as a parent. His own wife and children been dead about two years. His wounds were still very visible. And I think it was just a very hard time for him. When my grandmother reflected a about him when he came back. She said the John J. Pershing that left is not the John J. Pershing that came back. And although she didn't have the lingo of post-traumatic stress disorder, she, she spoke about it uh, being uh, an example of, of a different kind of a, of, a, of a death. He was shocked. And I think he carried every one of those soldiers on his back. He was very interested in their welfare. I just think it was a lot for him to bear. General Pershing and Patton fought together in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, creating a bond between the two men that lasted a lifetime. You and I had spoken about the Pershing Rifle Cadets and the Blackjacks, and they have all been very respectful. Every one of them had something to say and they all said that they never expected to feel the way they did. The First World War is the best example to really see the hell of it all. Yes. After leaving Montfaucon, the cadets come to a unique museum where the devastating effects of World War I can still be seen and experienced today. Jean-Paul de Vries, a Dutch immigrant to France, has been discovering and collecting 100-year-old artifacts of warfare found in nearby fields and displaying them in his museum. Everything which is here I found myself and only five kilometers around this house. And the reason I'm doing this museum is that uh, I work a lot for school kids that I want to show them that the, the moment you take off a helmet, it's a human being. I don't mind the color of his skin, the religion, or uh, nationality. If you look at this helmet there, there's 14 bullet and shell holes through it. It's game over. This is a shell casing of a cannon. It became a flower. So war can make art. All these parts have been touched by war, changed forms, uh, holes in it, a rifle which became like a snake. That's explosions. And that's... Um, but a lot of people don't understand that this war, shelling Verdun, 27 million shells in what is it, 300 days? 27 million? On display here is the so-called Iron Harvest. Unexploded bombs, poison gas canisters, live bullets, shrapnel, and barbed wire left behind in 1918, but dug up by French farmers every year since the end of the war. There are maybe 1,500 mestins hanging here. That means 1,500 soldiers lost their mestin, which means you're either wounded or dead. Seeing and holding in their hands the personal items of soldiers long dead speaks to the cadets about the sacrifices these men made to create a better future for us all. The machines and the equipment and the technology that made France and Great Britain and Germany and Russia, the masters of the world. You know, they, they all turned it on each other. I don't think the world had ever seen bloodshed like that. The Germans took all the colonies. The, the English were not happy with that. The French wanted back Elsa Slora and everybody wanted, they wanted war. That's the crazy thing. The politics wanted war. Yeah. Not thinking about these men, but they wanted war. I do my job for you as a soldier. You guys becoming a soldier or our soldier, I don't know yet, but that's why I do this, to respect soldiers. It's a job, it's a dirty job, but you have to do it. Thank you. Thank you. With the tools of war fresh on their minds, the cadets drive to their next stop. They are transported back in time. That night, in the San Miguel Forest, they catch up with the reenactors they had met earlier. 
The reenactors portray German, French, and American soldiers, recreating history in the actual trenches where the deadly battles of World War I took place. Salut, ça va? The show it's talking about the First World War and uh, it's about the living condition of the French soldiers, of the German soldiers. It's uh, interesting to meet here 100 years after on the same location and to, to play the show. Some of them, uh, they have their grandfathers who they really fight here. In 1950, there were really big fights here near San Miel in this tranche here. The First World War, it was a war of position. Some of tranche, they were occupied by the French and then two weeks after, it was uh, conquered by the German and so on. This war of position dragged on for four years, causing millions of casualties. Sitting in a trench that would have been used in uh, World War I, I never thought that I'd be so up close and personal with the history. People actually lived in these conditions. I can't even imagine about what they went through. If we were not coming to help us 100 years ago, could be German territories. After their trek through the battlefields of France, it is fitting the last site to be visited by the cadets and Sandy Pershing is the final resting place for the heroic soldiers of World War I, the massive Meuse-Argonne Cemetery, which contains the largest number of American dead in all of Europe. We're at the Meuse Argonne. There's over 14,000 people buried here. I mean, I bet you everyone here consider themselves, you know, brothers in arms. Uh, we know that there's, what, 16 pairs of brothers actually buried here. In addition to the large number of Americans laid to rest in the Meuse Argonne Cemetery, there are many men who fought for America, but came from other countries and were not yet American citizens. You know, there's another class of soldiers in the AEF that probably deserve our attention, and those are the immigrants. Eli Mutik is probably a great example of this. Originally from Hungary, his story, one of his officers actually gets into trouble. He goes up to provide suppressive fire and to help his officer. By doing so, he was killed just a couple of days before the armistice. He was awarded, you see on here, the Distinguished Service Cross. They estimate as many as a half million immigrants fought in the AEF. From my own personal experience with people that I know that have been immigrants from this country, they're the hardest working, most dedicated people I've ever met. That right there, I mean, he's earned the title of an American. So many people were really proud to be Americans. We have to study, we have to know our history, or else we are doomed to repeat it. No. I think being here, like, it changes the whole dynamic. You know, there are Americans your age, the age of the Blackjacks and, and younger, who literally don't know that we were in World War I. That they don't understand the sacrifice that these people made that their families made, and that people like Freddie Stowers made. One last gravesite David wants to show Kevin is the final resting place of an American hero, the African-American Freddie Stowers. Freddie is a young corporal. He's advancing on the Hindenburg Line, which is supposed to be this impenetrable line that won't allow the Allies to reach the fatherland, right? He gets mortally wounded in the process, but because of his actions, the unit was able to successfully take that trench, essentially breaching you know, the Hindenburg line there. Freddie's the first African-American to win the Medal of Honor in World War I. I just see it as motivation and being that I get to be here and see this, I get to say that I was a part of history because I got to stand here and look at this. And so it motivates me even more to keep doing what I'm doing. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's tough. You ready? I'm trying to be. After learning firsthand about one of America's greatest military heroes, it is time for the Pershing Rifles, Pershing Angels, and Blackjacks to return home. Seeing up close the people and places where General Pershing changed the course of history for the United States and the world has proven to be a life-changing experience for everyone. They'll remember always following General John J. Pershing's Pass of Glory. It does seem amazing that civilized nations should continue to adhere to war as an element of national policy. This nation, as one of the great powers, can do no less 
in the fulfillment of its manifest duty to humanity than to make the most earnest and devoted effort for the preservation of world peace. Oh, 